All right, at this time I will call to order the Wednesday, November 9th, 2022 meeting of the uh, board of the Lake Harbor Watershed Protection Commission. And the first item on our agenda are the minutes of the um, September 14th meeting. Are there any uh, amendments or comments? All right, seeing none, I'll seek a motion to approve. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Well, you know, actually, we'll give it to you because it really should be a verbal second. Oh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, ah, I'll speak up. Now. Yeah, all right, you go <laughs> So, all right, all those in favor? Aye. It's got to be a long one. Um, <laughs> Next, we have the consent agenda. Uh, as, as we've been doing before, we're handling uh, these items as a consent agenda. That is to say, if you want to discuss one of them specifically, you should t make a motion to take it out of the consent agenda. Um, having said that, is there a motion to accept the consent agenda items? So moved. Is there a second? Second from Marianne. Second. All those in favor? Yeah. All right, those items are approved. Next, we have um, Tracy Roy with the draft 2023 budget. Hi, um, I'll introduce myself a little bit. I'm Tracy Roy I'm with the city of Lewiston, just started about six months ago. Um, I am familiar to the area, I grew up in Lewiston. Um, as Ms. Villado mentioned, I also worked in Auburn about 13 years ago. Um, this is my first meeting, so bear with me. Um, I don't know if she usually goes line item to line item or just gives you like a brief overview of the items that are changing on the budget. So um, if you notice the first, the source protection management is going to be up, um, or I should say up from what's projected for this year, but the same as last year. Um, there's projects that are going to be done, capital projects, the water patrol, um, that's the reason why it's up. The next, repairs and property of equipment um, is down. That is due to the fact that there will be a boat purchased. So the maintenance on an older will not be taking place, so that has decreased. And then the next item, of course, is the legal. Um, which is results of the litigation. Um, so that is being increased a little bit. Um, I don't know, those are the three that we touched, I would touch upon that are different. Glenn would. Just a curiosity, under the forestry, the, the 23 budget is lower than any of the previous expenditures over the last average. And I believe it's the fact that I thought that they were going to stop cutting trees. It's because there's a yeah, moratorium. You've adjusted, the, you've adjusted right. the revenues as well? Yeah, that looks like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Regarding the legal, is that just um, the law pick legal or is there legal from AWD or Lewiston Water being paid by law pick? You know, it's just a litigation issue that is... Um, just the legal that's brought up by this com commission? Mm -hmm. Right. Right, I, I assume that, I mean, we've retained counsel, and I assume we want to make sure that we can pay Correct. for counsel if we need to. Correct. I don't know, why, what a novel idea, right? Pay for counsel. Well, to... <laughs> I thought that's why he was on the board. <coughs> I got a license to pay in our counsel, right? <laughs> I have one question for Erica. Mm -hmm. One of the projects was uh, Ty and Bob's recommendation for Blanchard Pond. What, was it? what is it that we're going to do there? Yeah, so we have a proposal from them. Um, there's a stream that goes directly into the lake that's mm -hmm. highly eroded, and it's pushing a lot of soil and sediment into the lake. Um, and it starts with this horse pond that's really high in phosphorus. It cuts mm -hmm. about half of the phosphorus in half by the time it gets to stream, about half that by the time it gets to lake, but it's still a high input. Mm -hmm. So we can do some regrading of that, some stabilizing of that to hopefully cut down on all of that um, sediment moving in there. So that's that's the project. Okay. And is that the project we had talked about, I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago? A couple years ago, ago. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, maybe I can't I have one other question. 
the first time I've, I've, I've seen the budget, so I apologize. I talked about total contributions from each entity, and it says operations, it's 58,250, but isn't it 58,250 from Auburn and Lewiston? So why would that number be? And it's the same historically, so that's why I don't understand it, I guess. At the bottom, the total contribution. The total contribution from each entity, it says operations, and it has a number of, oh. of 58,250 under the estimated for this year. It's above, it's above, are you looking above? It says contributions. Arbor Water District contributions, Lewiston. Right. 60 right. and 60. Down bottom, I right. think. Right, but, but, but when you add it up, it's only 58, 250, and 20, which equals 78, 25. So I'm missing, I'm missing 58,250 in my head. I don't understand why. Under the operations? If I look at uh, revenues contributions, mm -hmm. they're both 58, yep. 250 for the two, the mm -hmm. two cities. But for the current, down to the total oh, sorry, the when current I year. I was looking at the budget here. Oh, Go no, ahead. it's uh, 60 over there. Same mm -hmm. issue. So it's 60 from each, but down at the bottom it says total contributions for operations from each entity is 60,000 oh, plus the 25 is 85. From each entity. I understand uh, that. But right, it, he's but just wondering should why it shouldn't be double, double what he's right. saying. But because we give a total of 85, which is the 60 and the 25 together, but there's another 60 somewhere. So there. I think it's just that so it's, it's supposed to represent 85 for each entity. It's not calculated yeah. in anywhere. Okay, I'm just saying, saying what it is. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the way so, I. So it's basically, it's, 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 okay. it's below the line, so it's, it's a note more than anything. Yeah. yeah, it's a note yeah. that each entity broken down, I guess, is. So I can add a note at the bottom. Yeah, that's fine. I won't ask next year. Yeah, it's just sort of the way it's been. I'm just going to do it. Right, yeah, it's just. First time I saw it, it's There you go. Other questions? Thank you for adjusting for, for legal moving forward. Actually, and thank you for adjusting for forestry. I think that's that was a question that I was going to have when this came out. Was how we, what were we going to? I was you just going to say, <laughs> is that Tracy doesn't really know all of us, so yes. I know I just gave her oh, the yeah. list of names. But if we could just go around before she leaves, because I, I don't think she needs to stay with She knows Glenn. She knows me. But yeah, so one of just so, like the position that we represent on the council yes, too. Uh, hi, hi, Amy Landry. I'm the executive director here at Ad Club. And I'm, and I'm actually representing Buckfield, Hebert, and Minot. Mm -hmm. okay. I live in Buckfield. Okay. That's what I'm doing. And Evan Sear, and I'm an auto rep. And the chair. For now. And the and No, like we have a bunch of that off the air, yeah. <laughs> Just the yeah, word, not the title. Okay. She's short term. Uh, Camille Parrish, I'm an Auburn rep as well. Dan DeLittle, Auburn Rep, also a Water District Trustee. Uh, Alan Holbrook, I represent Turner. Uh, Carolyn House, I'm an employee of Balcock Education Outreach. I'm Erica Kidd, we've talked a little bit, so I work for Auburn Water District and City of Lewiston Water Division. I'm the Watershed Manager. Uh, Mike Broadbent, I work for the Auburn Water and Sewer District and I am the Secretary to the Commission. Excellent. So, uh, this is the draft budget. Is it doesn't seem like there are any questions that we would need to revisit. So, is there a motion to accept? I'll make a motion to accept the budget as presented. Motion to accept as presented. Is there a second? Second. We'll give Miss Landry. Is a motion to accept and a second? Uh, if there's no discussion, we'll take a vote. All those in favor? One against. And against. against. Cost apportionment. <clears throat> All right. We are now on to item four, which is um, public comment. So there are no bylaws for LAPAC. That's something that uh, Rick Lachapelle, the assistant chair, and I are working on. Um, so uh, I think that um, last meeting we allowed for public comment under individual items. Uh, I think that seemed to work well. People were able to speak to that specific item when it came up as opposed to having to speak ahead of time. Uh, so for the general public comment, I would, I would say uh, if there's something that we're not going to be covering, uh, uh, we'd love to
to hear from you at, at this time. And if you want to talk about something else, that's fine as well. But know that we'll make sure we have a public comment um, when we cover um, subsequent items to make sure that people can make comments when they make sense within the, the agenda. Mm -hmm. So is there, is there anyone from the public that would like to address the LawPack board? Okay, seeing none at this time, we're going to move <coughs> on to a uh, staff report as we've done in the past. Uh, we've listed these as deemed necessary by staff members. So uh, first uh, staff member we ask is uh, Mr. Brockman. Uh, thanks. Uh, a lot of what I would bring up as far as activities Erica had in her consent agenda. Um, I think at the boat launch is wrapped up. Um, there was a couple of uh, incidents around the watershed, I guess. Uh, <coughs> we did on the during the Route 4 project, we were, were staying on top of the contractor uh, with their their road closures and their, their, I'm sure everybody drove through that traffic. We did have a vehicle that, that did wind up going out of the construction zone and into the wetland on the outlet side of the lake. We did some remediation work uh, between the Auburn Water District and Lewiston uh, Water Division and we got that cleaned up so that was taken care of. And then about three weeks after that there was a car on Lakeshore Drive, uh, the second one on the year, that uh, swerved to miss a deer and wound up in the lake. Uh, we did respond after hours and work with the fire departments to get that out. Fortunately, with that one, the car was not damaged and there was no release of fluids and it was as quick as it went in the lake, it came out of the lake and there was no apparent harm. So. Well, you could, yeah, there was one earlier in the year, right? Where yes, that was one was worse. Yeah. Fluids, okay. that, that car was damaged heavily before it went into the lake and so it went in, it did release, but it was well contained and cleaned up. And they both pretty much the same location, right? Within a few hundred yards of each other, yeah. There's something that we should be looking at, trying to do preventatively that. <coughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to have some repeated problems. It's pretty open, too. I mean, there are other areas that are pretty open, too, but... Right. Um, I think speed tends to be an issue on that. I think that was certainly the issue yeah. with one. The second yeah. one, they really weren't going that fast, and it was, you know, it was. that's why there was no damage when they went in. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, mm -hmm. Hadn't had any for years, and we had three this year. So yeah. that's all I all I have, I guess. Excellent. Are there any uh, questions? None. All right. We'll move on to Mrs. Kidd. Erica, do you have anything that you wanted to share? Yeah, I think um, everything I wanted to cover was in the water quality and watershed reports. Um, nothing other than those cars going in the lake. I don't think anything additional other than what was included in the packet. All right. Any questions? Seeing none, we will move on to old business. Um, we had asked Erica to give us some um, information previously, and so this is where this ended up. So uh, we asked for a water quality testing overview. Um, I think that was really kind of help us understand what exactly it is, how it happens. Yep. Yep, so I included that in the packet. It's mm -hmm. under water quality testing overview. Right. Um, so basically there's two main types of testing that our staff do. They do the tributaries, so streams coming into the watershed, coming into the lake. Um, that's done approximately every other week from ice out to ice in, and we also try to catch rain events as they come through. I mean, the summer was very dry, but we saw a lot of precipitation this fall. So if our staff can get out within 24 hours of a rain event, they try to. Um, it's not practice for us to have them going out and getting like overtime on the weekends or anything. So this is during the week when they're at work. Uh, I included a map here. I know it's a really small scale on a eight and a half by 11, but that shows our 15 routine sampling sites in the watershed. Mm -hmm. And we do have several along Spring Road, but that was bone dry for most of the year. So we only do those if there's actually water flowing through there. Um, yeah, the number of sites that get sampled each time depends on the amount of flow. And I listed out here all of the parameters that we collect. So those go into our data sheets every other week. We have them year over year to help us keep an eye on things. 
um, and what's moving in the watershed. We also do in-lake sampling once a week, every week from ice out to ice in. There are six buoys that are placed out on the lake, so um, our staff take the pontoon boat out and their sampling equipment and they go hook up to those buoys every week. Um, they collect water quality data at every meter at each site. So the sites are all different depths. Some are deepest spot is about 33 meters, some are five meters, some are I think 17 meters. So you're getting like different profiles of the lake is the point of that. Erica, quick question. Um, on the buoys, there's something orange between Rex Roads and the hotel loop. Is that a, a marker for one of the buoys? Yes. Oh, okay. It is, that's one of our shallower sites. Yeah, okay. Yep, <clears throat> that's one that we added in either last year or the year before. 32. Um, it's 29. It's kind of like up in the cove up there. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that's one of our sampling stations. Um, there's different methods that we use for collecting water quality samples, different tests that are run. Um, and then we also have, working with baits, there's a buoy that's stationed out at the deepest part of the lake that has solar panels on it. It's called Margaret. And it has, pro yeah, it's a name, namesake, Holly Ewing, Dr. Holly Ewing, she works at Bates, uh, it's her mother's name, right? That's right. Yeah, so that's stationed out there, also ice out to ice in, and that has probes connected to it, taking temperature and dissolved oxygen readings. About every few meters, it's, there's different intervals, but we can watch that live, which is really helpful. So there's an online website, it refreshes every 10 minutes, unless we set it to save battery, and then it's a couple hours. Um, so it's a really useful tool. So you'll see that out there too. Well, it's in the closed zone, but that's one of our stops. And then we have turbidity meters that are online that are taking readings 24-7. So that gives us a live feed too. So that's kind of an overview of what we do for data collection. And then just the map of our collection sites. And as I mentioned last meeting, you know, we look at this... Typically in the winter, we'll sit down with our staff and look at it and say, are there any areas that we want to add, any that maybe aren't giving us really valuable information that we want to get rid of? And then that's how we ended up adding in that site by Rex Roads. You know, that's a shallower site. Um, it's across from Spring Road where, I don't know how many years ago, but there was a large deposit of sediment that went in the lake there, so we wanted to just see what was going on there. And we added in Spring Road a couple of years ago. Um, added in Blanchard Pond, I think in 2018. That's that small horse pond that I was talking about that project with Ty and Bond. That's kind of the headwater for a stream that comes into the lake. And then, you know, if something, some issues come up in the watershed, the, like a couple of years ago, Jalen Trailer Park had a septic issue. So we go out and test the lake right at the closest point where that might have gone in to see if we're seeing anything. Or with the DOT project, you know, they sprayed some hydro seed. There's evidence that it went into the lake, so we did some testing there. So those kind of things pop up, but those are usually like a one-off. Or there's a horse farm in West Auburn Road. There are water quality concerns there. We'll go out, collect some samples, and if we feel like we need to keep going to those spots, we will. That's kind of a big picture overview of what we do. Um, and we have worked with Holly and Camille in the past and other partners to see, you know, do we have gaps? Where, where else should we be looking? Do you guys think we're missing anything? Any questions on that? So, Eric, I was just going to ask, uh, so once you get the data, mm -hmm. um, I assume it's reviewed to determine any major fluctuations in the different things that you're testing yep. throughout the areas? Yep. So. And Yep, we have our, our two lab staff. One person's been there for, I think, over 20 years, and one's been there about four. So they'll let me know, and then our plant manager know, you know, oh my gosh, we're seeing, like, you know, really high phosphorus, or we're seeing higher fecals here, or something like that. And depending on what it is, we can either track it over time, or see, okay, yeah, this has been getting worse over several years. We really should do something at this site. So that's, it helps inform our decision making. So, so you make decisions based on yeah, and some of it's and where you need to focus your yeah and energies. Yeah, and some of it's it's hard. There's not always an immediate mm -hmm. solution or immediate reaction to it. But mm -hmm. other times, I mean, if we 
that our staff do like the fecal testing. So if there's all these flocks of birds on the lake, yeah, we can have our biologists that we partner with come out and take care of that. Um, so the city uh, has, city staff has suggested that moving forward, um, they work with partners like ourselves to monitor the lake. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I look at that and I say, it, it, it's nice for us to, to be partners with them, but really we're more like enforcement of the AWD. It would be nice to see sort of some of that stuff coming from AWD as well. But are we are we in a position to be able to help with that kind of stuff? I mean, I guess they're looking at specifically impacts of of septic, and is that are we are we measuring the kind of things in the water that would give us any feedback on that? Yeah, we are. So they test for nitrates, nitrites, total nitrogen. Those are okay. typical yeah. indicators. Yeah. Phosphorus can be linked to that too. But yeah, so we we test for those routinely. Um, nothing has sent up a flag that there is an issue associated with septics, but. Just as an example of, so we have worked with the city before when there was talk about reopening Outlet Beach. Right. Um, our staff went out and did some bacteria sampling out there and, you know, communicated and worked with staff on that. So certainly there's an opportunity there. We might already be doing it, um, depending on what information they wanted. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> How far back does this kind of data go? So this, almost this exact monitoring plan came out about in 2013. So in 2011, 2012, there was poor water quality in the lake. There was a fish gill. There was a large diagnostic study done after that. And this scale of monitoring came out from that. There was in-lake sampling before that. It just wasn't as robust. And if I was looking at that first year and now, dramatically different numbers? Um, I think very different situations, very different um, different water quality. So you had the year with the fish kill, and then there were a few, yeah, yeah, so you had that, but like starting point, so that was not good. Um, then there were a few good years, and then in 2018, we started to see more blue-green algae growth, so we did copper sulfate, and as a follow-up to that, 2019, we did alum, and now we're a couple years out from that. So it's a little hard to compare. Um, I think both of those chemical mm -hmm. treatments changed things. So it, we're looking at a kind of a different system now. Um, so based on all that, we have better or worse water quality today than we had the year after the fish kill? Um, I'd have to look specifically. I mean, it's not bad. I can tell you that. And we did see, we saw a little bit of a drop in phosphorus after the alum treatment. So that was definitely ticking upwards around that time period to, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Um, yeah. I, I would just point out that this year the, turbid, you know, the turbidity mm. was quite hot. It was above one. For yeah. For, so all of September and October, mm -hmm. and you could only see like three meters down. So the water quality, because of the drought and the heat, I think was not very good, you know, starting in August. So, and, I and, saw some changes in my pond. And, and if you look at the data that uh, Erica provided us, you'll see that some there's a lot of blue yeah. ones, and those are where phosphorus numbers are quite high. Mm -hmm. And some of that's related to the large rain events we had mm -hmm. and bringing in a lot of sediment into the lake. So, I, from my perspective, you know, the lake is not as good quality as it was like a decade ago. But there has been actions, as Erica has said, to try to address some of that. But. Yeah. Yeah, the... the Drought summers and then large rain events aren't helping anything. Yeah. It's sad that we look at the trends in operational <coughs> meetings on a monthly basis too. So it's kind of nice to see them mm -hmm. on the screen and just kind of going back and forth and just what was this about? So this conversation about it all the time. Yeah. It's not just the lab people. Nope. 
additional questions? Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, and previously we had asked Erica to give us an idea on LawPAC held properties and I'm gonna hold that up. Uh, sure. where those properties are and the priorities that Everybody. staff uses sometimes to present possible acquisitions. Yeah, I think I just had this in my notes from last meeting that it was a, a question of could we have a you know, large scale map showing the properties we own. So all of the green properties are owned by the Watershed Protection Commission. The light pink are life estates. So we have agreements with the owners of those properties that pretty much, you know, when they pass or their heirs pass uh, the property, we, we technically own it, but they are allowed to live there. It will be completely handed over to the commission. And then the purple are conservation easements. So there's, a, there's only a couple, um, but they're spread out throughout the watershed. So there's a few in Auburn here. And those basically are, are protected from any development activities. Um, and then if, they're, if the property owners who agreed to those easements wanted specific things spelled out in there, you know, either no hunting or certain recreation limits, those are spelled out in the conservation easements too. And those get monitored once a year by Androscoggin Land Trust. So they'll check out the boundary lines, they'll check out um, the terms of the conservation easements, make sure everything's up and up with that. And the most recent one that we bought is a tiny little one down here. It's about 0.6 of an acre, but that's where that Point of Pines property was that we talked about that's in the closed zone. Um, and Auburn Water is going to do the demo on that and get the septic out of there probably this month. So there's a lot of properties that used to have camps on them that have since um, been raised. And the other piece I included in here, somebody had asked about, you know, how do we prioritize acquiring land? And some of these parameters were spelled out in the original application for uh, waivers for filtration for Lewiston and Auburn. Um, so that's, or was originally documented in that watershed control program that had to be in that waiver application. Um, so this is just pulled, I think, from that or a summary of that that gives you, you know, prioritization list of, of how we pick properties to purchase. This is just kind of a background informational for you guys as requested last time. Okay. Uh, if I remember correctly, though, it's been sort of an issue because we, don't, we never, like we use these, but we haven't actually officially adopted these, if I remember correctly. I, I don't know if they were officially adopted, yeah, actually. We, I believe they, the because I don't know when that was, was, draft, was draft. draft. Yeah. okay. Yeah, so it would be nice to know if we had officially adopted these. If we hadn't, we should move forward in Excuse adopting me. Policy for identifying. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. if, like if, if it's not official, we, we should make it an official plan. Um, officially adopted. Uh, I had a question about the conservation easements. So, uh, those are those are properties that that we track, knowing that they have a conservation easement on them, but we're not involved in those easements. They actually. So we are the holder. The commission is the holder of the easement. Okay. Yeah, okay. they are named as that. Okay. On all of those properties? Just the purple. Yeah, right, yeah, just purple. Yep. Okay. And we're able to, and the ALT for $3,325 does all the paperwork and monitoring exactly. and all that. Exactly. Documentation, photos, they send me reports every year. Pretty good deal for that. So is that based on acreage? I mean, if we were to increase more of those perpetual easements, would would that be included or would that cost us more money? I, I, I assume it would cost yeah. us more. Um, 3300 bucks would be <coughs> cheap for that many properties. I've talked to a few, um, spoke to a few commissioners the last few weeks actually, and um, there's an interest in actually putting perpetual easements against invasive development on our properties. So um, I would like to see that as a future agenda item, but we should find out how we can do that without burdening this commission or any future landowner. So meaning, 
the green right now could be more perpetually protected and be more like purple against residential commercial development, for instance. You know, we can still have recreational access, we can still have environmental programs going on, <clears throat> stuff like that, you know, education outreach. But there's no reason why these commissioners, I mean, I, I think most of them are on board with protecting these things perpetually. Well, I think it makes sense given that, uh, I mean, we currently own those properties, but there's no guarantee that we always exist, right? <coughs> if our goal long term is to, is to sort of ensure that, I would think that's something we would want to look at. We have more legal money to do it. Yeah, I, yeah, right? So, future agenda item, please. So, having the commission held properties, basically having all of them in conservation easement. Or right. still so prioritize if there's a cost to it, you know what I mean? Yeah, there like definitely what is. In a year or something like that, I don't know. It's more of the pros and cons, I guess, at this point. So it's a legal question. How do we protect them without burdening us financially? By state law, if you have a specific conservation easement similar to the ones that are there in place, there's, there's a requirement to do what Amsterdam Land Trust is doing. Yeah, you have to monitor them once Right. I think there are yeah. other legal mechanisms that would not require that same monitoring, but could still tie the property up so it couldn't be built on. It may be less expensive. What do you have know what that would be? Input a deed. Pardon? Rewrite the a deed. A deed restriction? Yeah, just put a deed restriction. Oh, so if you have a transfer, it just can't be used for anything else. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, less money. But you also yeah. don't have the monitoring, somebody out checking it, I mean, which are right. all concerns, but. Um, deed restriction. I think it's less of a concern if it's at least in the short term, our land that we're monitoring. Right, like, right. I mean, I'm going to. Give Lord do them all at once. Like, yeah, because I'm doing one of them. Yep. All right, I'll put that on as a. Is that something other people want to see as a future agenda item at some point? Yeah. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. I had a question about the map. I wasn't clear what the hatched areas are. Oh, yes. Um, so that is in the closed zone of the lake, and then the properties that are held by the commission are also hatched. Hatched. Um, and so those are not open for public access because they are along the closed zone of the lake. So those are still owned by the yep. commission. I yep. wasn't because they weren't green, I didn't wasn't clear on that. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So are the other properties in that zone the highest of priority? Um, if they're in that zone one and they have lake frontage, mm -hmm. yes. So that would actually be like the top of category. Yeah. Land of French on a lake is always top number one, but this would be even more important. Yes. Um, we do have a, a map with the Auburn Water District charter that has like zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. And oh, yeah. so, yeah, I was just going to say, I don't know if this, this category one might be that zone one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we were to adopt this land acquisition prioritization, that little map would be helpful with it. Yeah. Yes. You know, to put all this together. Yes. Yeah, so I was a little bit more. Yeah. I've made a I've made a note of that for a future future meeting as well. But yeah, I think it needs mm -hmm. to be adopted with. I think it should be adopted with a map that we update every time we acquire a piece of land, so that way that map actually goes with that that within our our document. Other questions or comments? We put the next agenda when it comes in the future. All right. I, I guess uh, one question I might have in, in the future, if we're going to discuss these categories again, is how, how did we get with the, to the 250 feet of the shoreline? Because I noticed in these reports they're recommending three to 400 feet. So um, that would be something. That we'd want to be consistent on if we, you know, adopting any regulations regarding location of septics or mm -hmm. development or whatever. So extend the shoreland state law to our own law that is even more restrictive. 
No, I think it, I think it would be more that the 250 would be a higher priority than the 400. Oh, I see. As I mean, far as fact, it, you, yeah. this may be layered. It's like yeah, yeah, if yeah. a property comes up that's within yeah. 250, that's more important than one at 400. Yeah, yeah. But right. identify that the 400 is important. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions, comments? All right. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, new business, assign or hire a clerk. Uh, this was put on me, and this is not a presentation. This is a, a request that we seriously consider um, hiring a clerk. I think we've sort of worked without one just because things have continued to work, but the reality is that in the absence of a clerk, um, someone ends up someone ends up having to do a lot, right? Work. And and but there's no but there's no there's nothing identifying who that person is, right? So it yeah, it's sure there's no money in the budget. Sorry. Right. Well, you know, <laughs> we just passed the budget. But it's 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 one of those things where uh, I think what we need to do is decide. What we want a clerk for, I think the clerk obviously would uh, deal with um, putting agendas together. I assume that the clerk would be the person we would um, authorize to uh, sign for um, legal documents, um, for legal counsel, but also for um, land acquisition, things like that. But this is on here. Um, I would really like I would really like board members to think about what those things are that they want a, they want a clerk for or think that a clerk should be doing. Um, and of course we have the list of, of those things um, that Sid and Kevin were doing so we can work from that as well um, and send that to uh, Rick and I as we as we kind of put together, a framework for bylaws that we can bring back. Um, it makes sense to describe the clerk while we're putting it together, but I would hope that we would have a clerk no later than within the next six months. I, I would love it if we could commit to that. Um, just because, like, again, it, it sometimes I work on some, some things, sometimes Eric is working on them, sometimes other people are working on things, but there's no and there's no structure. There's no structure as to cool structure. So right. certain items. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that and that's been an issue in the past. I, I can tell you, you know, anecdotally with with Erica and I where Erica will send something to me and I mean I I get busy and it gets put in the back and now I'm getting back to her and it's like it would have been really nice for her to have feedback much earlier, right? Um, but uh, so I Having one person that has, has specific responsibilities, I think, would be important. Uh, and if we don't want to hire a clerk, uh, I think we need to, when we write our bylaws, let's go through and identify roles and responsibilities. And I'll come back to that again when I get to. So you said there is, like, excuse me, a list from past clerk with what the description was that you can sign? I don't think there was a description per se. Um, or like so much that. as a, there wasn't a, a, there was no description, per se. But if you if if we wanted, we could certainly. If, if, how about this? I will talk to Erica, and we will sit down and and list out those things that the clerk was doing, and I'll mm -hmm. send that to you guys. Mm -hmm. okay. There's also a set of minutes that when they voted the clerks in that kind of briefly described what they would be doing. Yeah, a little bit, but over the years, I know that that role expanded, and there were some votes to sort of grant authority, but the votes were, didn't have specific language in it, so it was sort of amorphous as to what. Can we just ask the past clerk and co-clerk? Yeah, we, we absolutely. Some no, we, advice on what they were doing? My assumption is that Eric and I, Erica and I would have. Okay. Would, but we're going to make a list of them, Kevin and Sid would go through it. Add or subtract. So if there was a, if we did choose later to pay someone to do this, that would just have to come out of surplus? 
We obviously just approved the budget. Um, I mean, even if it's covered by some dollars or $1,000 for four meetings or whatever, it's as well. Yeah, or, or else we'd have to go back and ask for more. I mean, mm -hmm. Yeah. That was part of the budget, I believe, under the annual. Oh, no. I'm thinking of. Uh, Thinking of our treasurer, not of our uh, clerk. Never mind. It's not in there. Yeah. Well, we can just ask it. Treasurer did not be paid. <laughs> you can talk about it if you're going to change the budget plan for the staff to approve it. Oh, yeah. I, I, they can just add the money in for it. Yeah. Any, any questions about that? That was really just me saying, like, we, we need to make a decision. Either we're having a clerk or not. If we're having a clerk, define that so we can get a clerk. And if we're not, Pushing out so you, you want a general consensus? I'm in favor of having a clerk. I'm in favor of having a clerk. Yeah. I would assume we all are. Yeah. It was more, really an update on where we are in it, but mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> I don't know. We pay our clerk five thousand dollars buck bill for the what? We pay our clerk and buck bill five thousand dollars just to do. Well, town business, the town business. No, I'm talking about the bar, the bar, the clerk. Oh. Um, all right. Maybe there's one more hours. We are going, so uh, we'll be, we're going to move on to new business B. Um, I assume that B and C, I would like to build in time for public comment. Um, and the way I'd like to do that is uh, the way we did it last time. Again, there are no bylaws to define how we do this, but if, any, if no one has an objection, I would say that... Uh, I would like us to hear from um, Erica. She's presenting these items. Hear from Erica first. Uh, possibly, if we have some. Um, well, actually, yeah, maybe we should hear from Erica and then and then the public. So I, I, I think it, we might lose track of the fact the public's here if we start asking questions. So, um, if no one objects, we'll hear from Erica. Hear from the public, um, and then we can talk about. <clears throat> what we want to do, if anything, with these, with these items. Does that work for everybody? Excellent. So let, let's take up the <coughs> 7B, the CDM Smith final draft of the peer review of the Grace Lawn studies. So this final draft incorporated the commission's comments and suggestions from our last meeting. And I think this draft is uh, much more digestible, much easier with the executive summary up front. It's right to the yeah. point, and it gives you the map that we had asked for that shows the original watershed line. So they call it the prior, it's on page three, the prior Lake Auburn watershed. It shows the revised Lake Auburn watershed in a red dash that was included in the AFP environmental study that the city had commissioned. And then they show towards the left here, this solid blue line, and that's where they're certain that the watershed line falls. And then there's two blue dashed lines that come off of that, that kind of incorporate this area of uncertainty that either we need more information on or there wasn't information on in the first place. Um, so just to go over this summary, you know, one of their notes is, that the groundwater data that they looked at supports revising the watershed line in some areas, and in other areas, the data are insufficient to confirm a precise delineation. So they talk about that solid blue line to the west. Um, they have confidence that that part of the line is correct. Once you get towards more of the center of this figure, you have some bedrock outcrops where it's questionable which direction water flow is going. And to the east of that, there's also a question of whether water flows ultimately to the lake or if it goes to a stream that goes to Androscoggin River. So those are questions remaining. And the consultants offered you know, some suggestions if we, if we want to determine in those areas of uncertainty which way the water is going. They said you can do a 3D Visual, visualization model, um, and that's based on just, it's a you know desktop exercise of looking at 
geologic data, well construction, water level, water quality data, topography, and then based on that model, they would find out if there's need for a field, field visit to collect data actually in the field and go out and look at the site. Um, so this is their, their final recommendation to the commission, and I guess from there that's, that's up to the board if we want to pursue gathering that extra information and modeling and field data to finalize where this line should go. Okay, um, so we've heard from Stephanie. At this time, uh, I would invite members of the public if they'd like to speak about this item. Uh, and since we are on record, um, if you could just state your name first. Uh, yes, I'm Stephen Beal. Uh, I've spoken at many planning board and other city council meetings and was here at the last meeting of this bond. Uh, at this point in time, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cold. Uh, the draft report has not been made available to the public, so there really isn't any basis for public comment uh, except for a couple of things that Erica just mentioned in her introduction here, uh, one of which referred to the tentatively well, the revised watershed line as contained in the FB environmental report of last year. That was the revised line that the Auburn City Council passed by uh, resolutions uh, changing the zone of both uh, the underlying uh, agriculture and resource protection zone to a general business zone and at the same time revising the watershed overlay zone all in one uh, resolution, one enactment of an ordinance uh, in two hearings, first on March 7, the second one on March 21. That activity was the subject of the repeal petition of that Grace Lawn ordinance change uh, which went on for the next two or three months, resulting in enough signatures which were certified by the Auburn City Clerk as being more than adequate in number and quality, uh, so that there were four alternatives presented to the Auburn City Council, uh, excuse me, two of which were actually matters that had already been passed by before the matter came to the Council. The Council on September 6th could either have repealed that ordinance, or they could have declined to repeal, thus putting it out to a public referendum, uh, which would have the possibility of either repealing or supporting the ordinance. The City Council chose to repeal the ordinance which it had passed in March. Therefore, at the present point in time, the watershed boundary is the original boundary that existed before March of this year, which is to say that it runs uh, from St. Dominic's Academy on the east to the Berry Farm on the west and to the Grace Lawn Road, except in the area of the ball field on the other side of the road, which was originally the landfill site unto itself. And that has been uh, the area to which the watershed protection overlay zone has been restored and where matters stand at present. There may be future activity concerning this area, but that's the present legal status of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else that wish to speak on this topic? Just had a question. Um, I, I applaud you just for the Bruce for you, you. Uh, 85 Mary Carroll yep. Street in Auburn. And uh, my question was, um, if, <clears throat> if they do this sample, you know, computer modeling, uh, and if you look at this memorandum from CEI, it says that Depending on how the sand and gravel pit is restored and developed, mm -hmm. the mounding could be eliminated with the groundwater flows returning to their more natural regional flow pattern where the area could contribute to Lake Otter. In other words, it could change direction. You know, right now we're saying that it goes towards the river, but depending on how the pit is, is developed, it could change. And, um, and I've heard this from a number of people who are pretty familiar with it. Uh, Norman me for one, who used to be the Auburn Water District Superintendent. Um, so, Erica, would, 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 it, would their study show that if it's, uh, that, that it could turn it around? I mean, and what would happen? 
um, based on if there were, if the pit was reclaimed and development did occur in there. Is, I, I think that's something they could consider. I think it would be hard to do that without an actual, like a development plan to consider. Um, otherwise, I think the possibilities are, are endless there with... I, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they could they could look at it as is right now, of course, and, and tell us, but you're right. If there's development that's going to go on there, that opens up the potential for change for topography and groundwater, both. So how does this get addressed? Um, that's something I can ask. I can ask them. Would this be something that gets addressed to planning board and the site plan review as far as making sure that whatever they do do doesn't get uh, into the water? It'd be the same if somebody built across the street from there and increased the elevation and sloped it the wrong way. Right. So it could go the other way. I mean, you can always build to go into the watershed or out of the watershed, and that's what the planning board and so the permitting can take care of. I, I, I assume, well, I don't have to assume, but I, that would be a part of any development plan process. I, I agree with Erica. I think it would be impossible to get that information without the development plan. Um, without seeing what grades they, they, they're going to use and what um, how they're going to treat their runoff, it's, it's impossible mm -hmm. to know. I mean, they, they could build something that um, takes this area in question out of question um, by building it up in such a way that it, it certainly flows away from the lake, but then it could go the other way. So it, there's, there's no way to know. Yeah. Whatever would go into the lake, that would have to be in a phosphorus plan. It would have to have proper treatment, right? I mean, it's not like they could just slope uh, 16,000 square feet of paved area towards the lake without some sort of treatment area according to Chapter 60. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> but, uh, so we're kind of getting to debate, though. This is really meant to be a public comment. Is there any, are there any other comments you want to make, Mr. Reed? No, no. I, I know that when I was on the on the watershed protection commission, uh, we were approached to buy that piece of land that that, uh, that we didn't buy because K and R uh, they wanted to retain the right to blast some ledge that was close to the lake, mm -hmm. and so uh, it was determined that if they blast, they could actually change the flow of the geology and make the geology go instead of going toward the river, by blasting, they could turn it around and it would go toward the lake and could damage the lake. So we ended up not buying the land. So if Gendron develops the pit, why can't the same thing happen based on how they're developing it? And I thought that's what I read in this CEI memorandum, but I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a geologist, I don't know, but that's the way I read this. So we're looking, so the CEI, so the one we're looking at is actually the CDM Smith right now. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. But there was a paragraph there, in there. Is, yeah, yeah, no, it does, it does, it it does reference it. Yeah. 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 And the okay. CEI memorandum that we have tonight also speaks to it. But yeah. I was just trying to clarify it. Yeah. Yeah. Which one, yeah. yeah. It was my question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Thank Sir, you. Can I raise a point of information? Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Up to this point, uh, my understanding is that the Smith and CEI review reports are uh, in late stage draft form, they have not been made available to the public, but uh, one was just picked up off the table here, and here it is. Uh, are we to have access to these reports at this time? Um, I apologize for not checking. Uh, usually the entirety of our packet is posted on it the is. website, and was it? So these were all? Yep, uh, they, yep, as part of the agenda packet, Steve, it was on, it did go on our website. Um, so these respective Smith and CEI memoranda are now can be utilized by members of the yes. public. Thank yes. Yes. They, yep. they would have gone on actually last week. Yeah. I, I just they, didn't disseminate them before putting up the agenda online last week. Uh, yep. Anyone else from the public wishes to speak on this? All right. Uh, well, we'll bring it back to the board. Um, 
So I, I guess uh, I'll start by asking a question that I think is, is paramount, and I'm going to ask it of our um, AWD representative. Did AWD, up, uh, did they change their watershed map? They changed their watershed map based on what the city had from the CEI study. And so the city's repeal, that changed to the city watershed map, but AWD has not repealed its revision. It, as soon as they submit that to us, we could put that on the agenda, but I was under the understanding the bylaws were on hold until the litigation gets wrapped up. Okay. But, but what I'm saying, that did get adopted, though. That, right. Okay. The original change. Okay. <clears throat> so. Uh, and also, basically, a policy that whatever the city of Auburn comes up with is what, because we don't have the technical expertise to be changing the watershed or any of the delineation out there. So whatever the city comes up with, through their engineers, through their, their development people, we would adopt this as the watershed boundary. Okay. Uh, I guess I asked that question because to me, having it looming that AWD has a, has a map that I'm assuming would not necessarily be in line with what might come out of tonight's meeting. Would, is important, uh, and that um, what I would like to see from us, and, and again, I had, I had asked everyone to sort of review these ahead of time and think about what you wanted, because ultimately what I would like is to see um, us provide a recommendation to AWD um, with regard to um, where, they, where the lines should and should not be drawn, essentially. So finish the work that needs to be done to identify what they have, or just share this. You, you, still, well, if you think this is the right one. Yeah. yeah. But this, this colored dashed line, <laughs> clear one here. Yeah. Well, well, so half of it's solid. Marianne, I can tell you. So there's a solid one, yeah. and then there's an area where, if we wanted to, there's sort of that line that's closer to Grace Lawn Road, yeah. Grace Lawn Road, which is the, the which is the safe. Which yeah, is the, the we know, yeah. and then there's the dotted line that's actually a little bit closer to Blake than what mm -hmm. um, uh, the city consultant got, and that's a possibility depending on information that we gather there. I would say that um, I would feel more comfortable utilizing that the boundary that's closer to Grayson and saying, mm -hmm. unless unless someone else wants to go. Um, it, the, it, if, if the city wants to go and spend the money to do that, and, and we could certainly look at the information and have CDM review that again, mm -hmm. um, but that I don't think we need to push that any closer. So for me, there's no need to resolve that ambiguity there. I'm, I'm, I think it's in our best interest to say there's ambiguity there, so that should not be taken out of the watershed. That's my personal opinion. Which would go to the water district, not the city. The city's already repealed it. I, I have a question for Dan on that, where you said the new rule is you'll adopt everything that the city has adopted for lines. Pretty is much also, what their watershed is is going to be what our watershed is. But wouldn't is that doing. also be the opposite? If they're repealing what that was, then that also so. is what you Absolutely. Is. So I don't think they have a different one. I think it's if it's following what the city has done. Uh, no, they've committed to not having a different one. They currently have a different one now. They do. So they haven't updated the so. link? on the City of Auburn website where the actual watershed line is because that link is what we refer to for our watershed boundary. Okay, I, I, I thought I saw a map that you guys had, like an actual map. Yeah, there's actually a link printed on it, I'm pretty sure, but... Well, again, see, but this gets to this whole... As, as an entity that's tasked with what we're supposed to do, I don't think it's in our best interest to just say, well, you know, AWD said they would do this or whatever. I think that regardless of whether or not they change the map, we have information that allows us to say, mm -hmm. if this part of the watershed boundary is ever changed, it should not de deviate from, the, from, from this. And if they choose to change it, they change it. And if they choose not to change it, they don't. Um, but that we have a statement now, instead of waiting to, to kind of play catch up later. Well, we have a right to make that stance. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree that we should take the conservative 
approach um, in terms of the the boundaries that they have drawn here. It's tentative uh, to be the most protected because we don't have the information unless we pay for that model as well as some additional monitoring wells in that area that's unknown. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I agree with you know what people are saying that we should be as conservative as possible and if we're going to recommend uh, some kind of uh, watershed boundary. Mm -hmm. I also think we've spent the money, we've gotten a good report here, a thorough uh, evaluation of the watershed, so I'm pretty confident that CDN has done a good job of evaluating the data that they have, but there is always the question at some point in the future, if there is development, what impact will that have? And hopefully the city at that point should invest the money. With a model, you could simulate what impacts things will have. But, you know, we I think we've done our due diligence as far as I'm concerned. So when you say the city, city of Auburn? City of Auburn. Could bear the full cost of that endeavor? I mean, the benefit is to both communities. I mean, I just, I mean, from a fairness of drug, I just can't imagine why one city would have to pay for that study and not both. And the only way it gets paid for by both is if we do it. So if this commission decides on where they want the watershed line, and they give that to the city staff, and they adopt that, wouldn't that just fix everything? As, as long as AWD... Well, AWD is that, gonna, already has a policy that says we're going to do what the city says. Okay. Um, and then I think that uh, acting as a commissioner, in this case, I, I would want language from us uh, stating that uh, any development, should the watershed boundary be changed, any development in that area that has been changed um, should demonstrate that it does not affect the watershed boundary as amended. Mm -hmm. um, just so we are literally saying it, it's good enough for us to say, well, we believe the city should do it, but right. we I believe agree. the city should do it. It's not doing our due diligence, us saying, we believe the city should do it, it's us, this board. Doing I think an important point, too, is so if the commission decides to go with this conservative line, um, I think it would be beneficial to reach out to the drinking water program and ask mm -hmm. them and say, if this line changes based on the information that was reviewed and the peer reviews that we requested, does that impact the waivers for filtration for both water utilities? Mm -hmm. Because those waivers were based on this original line. So I think it's really important to have clarity from them mm -hmm. that if we go with this, will that have an impact for the utilities? And Auburn Water adopts it. And if City of Lewiston adopts it, does that change anything for those waivers? Okay. Um, I, I think it's certainly reasonable to ask. To ask. Mm -hmm. um, Just my, find out. My question is going to be, how soon are they going to get back to us? And when is the next time we're going to meet? Understanding possible timelines um, at the city, it might put us a, in a situation where we're joining them lately because we will be commenting after. Um, well, can we, we can do, do everything but that. Like still do what we said and then still reach out to the drinking water program and you like. Well, I think what Erica is saying is we ought not to adopt right. it at all until Unless we reach out yeah. because to adopt it and then find out that it would be. Yeah. Right. If is the city of Auburn like not cooperating with this data, or no, uh, th there's no discooperation at all? There's no. Why don't we ask them to sure. review it? Because we can. Because we have a responsibility, mm -hmm. and it doesn't much matter to me what the city does with mm -hmm. this information. Okay. As a board, we have a responsibility <coughs> to do something with information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to take a stance. Correct. Right. Rather than just what we don't think they have an issue where we think they'll do this. I mean, our responsibility is to make sure that we say what we want, right? And not assume that they're going to do what we think. Okay. 
<laughs> Who has this? The chair wasn't paying attention. Yeah, so I, he ignored No, I, I'm listening. I was writing down. <laughs> he yes. was raising his hand. Who has the statutory authority to actually establish the watershed line? The city of Auburn has statutory authority to establish an overlay zone. Mm -hmm. The Auburn Water District, I would say, has the has has the trump card with regard to the authority to set the boundaries, because whatever Auburn Water District does, um, I get well. It really comes down to whichever is the strictest will carry. But the Auburn Water District has been granted the, the power to do that. So I think that we have all relied on the city of Auburn to manage this Lake Auburn watershed overlay. So um, all we have is to make a recommendation of where we believe the line is. We don't we can't actually set the watershed line. No. We simply no. say no. Based on what we've learned, this is what we think you should put it. Well, I would argue that no one can set the watershed line. I know. It's a ge geological yeah, I, I get that part, right? But, but obviously the geologists are arguing, uh, so. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, and, 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 and I'll be clear that um, we, can rate, we can make a recommendation to the city of Auburn, but I would like to see this board leaning on AWD more. Um, having AWD enact that statutory authority they have to do these things. Like in this case, this would be one of those cases, right? Um, so I know we're hearing that AWD is committed to using whatever line. Well, right now they're committed to but, litigation is what they're committed to right but, now. Right. So, so, okay, so, so moving back to this, so it sounds like, um, it sounds like there's no objection to us mm -hmm. taking a stand with regard to this, right? Making a statement. It sounds. If any change would hurt our drink. It sounds like. It sounds like. We're generally in agreement that if we were to take that that, that statement would utilize the most conservative boundary. I would pause, possibly. I would pause to think that. Hearing from the drinking water, whether it's going to affect our waiver. Marian, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Good. I'm getting there. Gotcha. I'm going. I'm going in order. So I'm seeing Glenn might not necessarily be, but it sounds like the majority is sort of <coughs> utilizing the more conservative boundary. Um, I guess I haven't really heard from, from Danielle on that, but I'm all for the conservative boundary. Uh, but I mean, I don't know where it's going to go if you ask the Auburn Water District to look at it at this point in time. No, I, I hear you. But we're doing our job by asking them. Right. Um, yeah, I agree. And that um, we shouldn't adopt a specific change. We shouldn't adopt any endorsement of a specific change until we hear from those uh, folks that regulate our <coughs> filtration waiver. State right. drinking water program. So, Okay, so we've talked a lot, but those are the things that I'm hearing mm -hmm. here? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that we probably can't, I, I would hesitate to have us create a recommendation to anyone until we hear back. Um, but I would certainly think it would be reasonable to make a motion to adopt uh, the conservative boundary as a tentative recommendation um, for for uh, a change in the watershed boundary, contingent upon it not affecting our waiver, so that we at least tonight can take action. And say tentatively, we would not support moving the watershed boundary any closer than this, and that is. Uh, it is tentative based upon feedback with regard to the waiver. Does that make sense? Okay. I said that in kind of a, is that clear enough for people to? Now you can repeat it in a motion. This is what I know, what I'm going to say. So I will, I will seek a motion. I would like to seek a motion, the motion that we tentatively adopt the most conservative boundary presented in the CDM report um, 
as uh, the maximum that we would support changing the watershed boundary in this area contingent and based upon uh, contingent upon feedback from federal regulators as to whether or not this will affect our filtration waiver. And this will be sent to whom? I think that we can't send it to anyone until we hear their back. Thank you. But I think Just we should at least tonight yeah. say we're, we're supporting this, we're taking this action. And are we, can we include, or is it necessary to include in that motion the contingency that this change would be evaluated at the point that development is, a development plan or development is proposed? I think it would be, re I think it would be reasonable to add that. No one's made the motion yet, so. Okay, I just was asking about yeah. how we can Now I see Glenn, Glenn, Glenn's the Glenn's thinking of, a, of an easier way to do this. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're tending to this, but I think it's a um, I mean, I think we, if we want to do it, we have a motion to recommend whatever line we decide that we're going to do based on the outcome of that information from the State Drinking Water Program. But the intent is that we do something and then wait. Uh, okay, so make, so make that motion. Well, okay, but I'm going to just, there's going to be discussion after I make a motion. Yeah. Then I'll make a motion I won't go for. I'll make a motion to recommend the conservative line of the watershed based on the outcome of the fucking of information from the State Drinking Water Program in regard to our filtration waiver. Is there a second? Uh -huh. Yes. I'll go ahead and get your second. 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 Point of clarification, the recommendation is to the Auburn Water District. I'm guessing we're you could get that. unanimous if you say, leave the I'm AWD a, a, out of it. I guess I'm to me, you're making a recommendation <laughs> to the world. I mean, yeah, I, I'm not recommending to you, I'm state. recommending to. Are you making a recommendation to support? Be... Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. what's the recommendation? Our recommendation to set that as the line, regardless of who it goes to. I just, yeah. I don't care. I'm just looking for. Right, and I understand, but I mean, to me, it's like to be specific, that means I'm not recommending it to anybody else. Okay. Um, now you want discussion? Yes, discussion. So I guess my issue comes in is that I understand, I guess, in principle a little bit about why I want to be that conservative, but if you want to be conservative, then go back to the old line. And the fact that CF, I know the letters, right? CDM. CDM put the other dotted blue line on there. And I admit, I am not a geologist, and reading this was painstaking. I think that the other line is fine, because obviously it gives that choice, and then I think there should be language around maybe some requirements for the planning process of any development within that to ensure those kind of things, to make sure that things aren't gonna go that way because I understand there may be some possible concerns. But again, I'll go back to, I can go across the road, build a mountain, it's all gonna run the other way. So it can always be a problem. So why couldn't we look at the other line and just put some regulations in around that so that the city has to, when it goes to planning board, I follow this criteria to be able to build in that area. Just for a second. To me, those two lines, one was a line of uncertainty and one was a line of certainty. Mm -hmm. And I would, that's why- And I they should have different for me. Yeah, no, I agree. The coloring them the same was sort of a mistake, but to me, that more conservative line is a line of certainty. And to your point, if we were trying to be conservative, why wouldn't we just push the- Go back where you used to Because we need to be responsible in defining the watershed boundary as a geological feature because if we don't, the problem is if we don't, then others won't, okay? And so it's like <coughs> the metric needs to be the, ge the geologic boundary of the watershed. Otherwise, it becomes a political line, not, not a so, line. So the people here would support the closer line if the 3D virtual high fun fancy study was done and proved what it could. And there were additional field work with monitoring wells in the area of uncertainty. What was described? So you're looking at, you know, 50,000 plus probably. Yeah, what was described to make that a certain line uh -huh. was quite a bit. Right. Yeah. But again, if we, and my problem is I, I always see the watershed line as a definitive, distinct, don't cross, don't do anything, no matter what you do on the other side for a developer. Mm -hmm. It's like you can't, there's no mitigation you can do on the other side of that line. 
but if that line was there, and we said, sure, developer, but you need to foot the bill for whatever it is that we, we want done, so that way the city's not paying for it, taxpayer's not paying for it, the developer wants to use it, they're going to pay for it. And that's my cost of half a million dollars. Don't be wrong. I got to meet with John next week. So really fact, the fact that, that I, said it, but. I, I would argue, Glenn, that the fact that this map exists and the other line is on there, if I were a developer and I wanted to use that land, I would go pay to have it done, and then I'd come back and say, look, see, it's not on the watershed. So to me, I would, again, use a conservative line, knowing that this other line has been delineated. Everyone can see it. It's a public document. Once this is once this is all done, it's going to be the same task to move it again as it's been this time, I'm sure. So if we, give, if we find a way to provide a way to get to that new line, instead of stop it, but that's okay with me. I don't think it should be an easy task to move on. Yeah, so. and I would say that the study that we're talking about someone paying for and doing the doing the monitoring wells and all that is going to result in a different watershed boundary line than what you see on this map. So it'd be somewhere in the middle. So that, that red line that the Arvin already said. Once. I think our task is as for the commission is protecting the lake and the watershed, and so when we have uncertainty, we should be as conservative as possible with that. And then if someone else wants to question, well, the well, they back it up, back it up you know, then they just can provide it and then yeah. we'll look at it. But I don't, yeah. I don't feel comfortable well, doing right. anything less yeah. at this point. I agree. Mm -hmm. okay. so. um, What about the part about in the motion adding language regarding potential development? So Rick and I have been discussing this uh, with regard to the bylaws. Um, we would like the bylaws to, this is a, a generally a friendly board, and we would like to continue to work well together. Yeah. And so we talked about utilizing, although it's not in Robert's rules, the concept of a friendly amendment and that a friendly amendment could go forward in the absence of disagreement, and if there was a member that disagreed, then we would ask that you utilize the formal process. So if everyone is okay with that right now, I would say, Camille, consider making a friendly amendment. To, to Glenn? To Glenn. <laughs> go Glenn, it. do you have the wording? <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure what you're trying to do now. Do you want me to read it back? No, no, I, I know what my motion was. What's the, what's the amend, what are we trying to amend of the Well, we had talked about um, that there's uncertainty, and if there was a development, you can't really figure out what's going to happen, for instance, with the surface water when you develop the site, unless you have the development plan. So. I don't know whether we need to somehow attach to your motion something about this uh, new watershed boundary is what we expect and, you know, are recommending at this moment, um, but there might be, with looking at a development plan, we need to be sure that um, their plan does not alter the ground surface and groundwater flow within that region. So am I hearing you that your friendly amendment you would like to ask for is that um, that recommendation also include that any development, any future development um, demonstrate that it would not change the groundwater, <coughs> and surface, surface water conditions that are currently present. That's right. Because okay. the flow towards the flow, lake. The flow, right? flow, the flow. Definitely flow. not change the condition. The flow. Yeah, change just the, the flow. flow. But it can't change, it can't allow flow to go is, towards the lake. Is that's that what I'm hearing? That's, that's exactly right. So I would, yeah. uh, at this point, I'm comfortable pretty much. I'm going to ask the planning board person to take the other head off. Yeah. Isn't that part of the planning board process with any development that is near a watershed already? It is, and I'll put my law pack hat back on and say, but we shouldn't rely on my other hat 
to do it, we should say it out loud if we think it should be done. Mm -hmm. And okay, so how is it? So then, my the question is: So we're saying that somebody wants to develop, planning boards going through their process. Somebody has to come present here, and we get to decide. No, no, we are making. You said that you want to make a recommendation to anyone that is looking at this, yeah. and part of that recommendation coming from us is us asserting that any development needs to demonstrate that they are not changing the directional flow of the groundwater and okay. the surface water. Towards the lake. And that's it. So, are you accepting that as? I am. Who, who, who second? You. This was a while ago. Who seconded the motion? I was perfectly frankly. I was perfectly frankly. Yeah, as well. Yeah, okay. Further discussion? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None being. Uh, I will make sure that um, we we approved. <laughs> in, we, we, we we approved a motion. Well, part of that motion was uh, a contingency that we checked with uh, drinking water program to determine whether or not it would have an impact on the waiver before we actually. So, like the support is contingent upon that. So. Um, and we please, and by we I mean you, you please. <laughs> the royal we. And you and I can work on it if you want. Um, but we need to send this to them and ask that specific question. Okay. All right. Excellent. So we've you? adopted, you've adopted and voted on this recommendation of support, conditional on those approvals. Yeah. Are you going to put this out, or have staff, being one of the two of us, put this out as a memo of recommendation, and then just send it to the affected agencies, Water District, City of Lewiston, City of Auburn? We're throwing this out there? Not that's directing it at anyone in particular? Um, that's an excellent question. I just um, want to abstain yeah. if it goes to the Water District. I don't, I'm not, I, I, I wonder if we need to do that that to me it was important to do this so that way if something does come up it can be it can be sent but then it doesn't necessarily have to be sent prior to any action being taken right. out no, of everyone else feels not a great question to me it's more like okay this is in our pocket now so next so if this comes well, up it's going to be posted on the website next month yeah, yeah i just it'll, think it'll be on, yeah. like, in my mind it's like do you want someone going down a path and then, oh, you know what I mean? Versus up front, we're just saying, this is... I'm assuming we share yeah. our okay. packets That's with AWD right. and Auburn and Lewiston. Right, but it becomes more of an official thing, whether it be on either a memo or a letterhead, that here we made this recommendation and we sent it to the effective agencies. And then that way they don't go down the rabbit hole and then find out, oh, wait, we had this. Well, you know, from... I, I'm guessing with the people sitting at the table that the agencies will find out pretty quickly. Can we, can we perhaps... But again, we're not... You can can't we assume everybody's going to? At the very least, my assumption, assumption is that this would get posted in our documentation on yep. the website somewhere, right? Yeah, this is already in our agenda right. packet, but like, and it but will like get posted our, as like we our just recommendation, but like, we'll like but as, but it as a recommendation, like once we hear back from, from drinking water, if they say no, this doesn't affect your waiver, then this would be posted. As one of our, not on the front, but one of our, one of our documents, right? Mm -hmm. We have like recommendations with regard because we have all all kinds of things. Like, how do we feel about this? What do we feel about that? You know, recommendations with regard to the. Yeah, you know, we were just Carolyn and I were just talking about that today, yeah. actually, and about okay. not just having the studies up there, yeah. but having some of our recent recommendations and yeah. documentation up there okay. too. Yeah. Um, you the secretary. Mm -hmm. I, I might ask that the motion be flipped a little bit to put up front that we're going to be going out to the drinking water program to ask for that information, and then based on the in that, if it would have no effect, then the board supported that. Because everybody was yeah. checked yes. that that's why so we're supporting yeah, that it. Does, that does changes enough. the language of the motion, but not the intent. Does, does, anyone, have a, does yeah. anyone have an objection to that? Because nope. if somebody yeah. reads that motion, they're going to get only as far as the, what they want to hear. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Okay. You know, but as, but as, far, as far as your question, Mike, um, I hear what you're saying. My worry is that if we send it out, it's like a tacit thing. 
it's a thing where like, oh, yeah. LaPec wants to change the boundary. Yeah. Whereas if we have it in our pocket, it would take it would be it would be a five minute meeting, special meeting, to show up anywhere where we would fit and say, Okay, we're making a motion, you know, the city is doing this, we're making a motion to to send this uh as as uh, a point of information, right? And then we can do it then. But my worry would be if we do it now, it's like the law pack wants to push the boundary. We're trying to push somewhere. Right. Does that make sense? And it's, yeah. not our, and it's not our desire. Right. It's just to go on record is what we think we can do. Right. So we're going to, you know, we're going to write a letter to the drinking water program on behalf of the Auburn Water District and Lewiston Water Division and request them to review this report and this recommendation by the commission on the map and ask for and clarification if that'll impact or affect can, the waivers. Can we send it from those two entities or does it have to be sent from us? Well, he's sending the whole thing on. Well, we paid for it, right? Well, then we would have, an ask, have to ask them to send it again. You know, I think it should that's, come from the utilities, like you're saying. You know, again, yeah. Auburn Water is the I was just thinking if it was sent, if it was sent water. from this commission, then we certainly need to copy them and make sure that they know that. You know, this is their PWSAID number. That's their waiver. Okay. You know, for us to send well, a, a letter. Okay, in that sense, yes. I, I would say it would it would absolutely make sense that they would be informed that we are asking that question. Right. Exactly. Yes. Okay. I see what you're saying. So I can come from the commission, but, I, but inform. I don't, I don't think, right. 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 I wouldn't want Mike, to send a letter on Lewis's behalf without. Hey, do you know what I'm doing? You know, I'm. Mike, I don't think we need a. I don't think we need a motion. I think. Right. No. I know. That just just be. So yeah. we'll, we'll we'll essentially CC them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Just to be right. clear, we're not asking the water district at this point to do anything. No. 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 Okay. Not, to, not to agree. So. It's okay. We, we need to notify that we no. are. No. We're seeking asking. clarification on this. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right. <coughs> uh, moving on. Next item, seven C, the CEI draft peer review of the environmental study. So we'll do this the same way we did last time. Erica will present, and um, we'll open it up to the uh, public if there are any comments. Um, firstly, I just want to go over what the, the scope for this project was again. Um, as a refresher, so it was for CEI to review the recent FB environmental study documents and evaluate the assumptions used to eliminate phosphorus loads to the lake under various build-out scenarios that consider proposed zoning changes and to evaluate the conclusions drawn from those assumptions as they pertain to water quality of Lake Auburn. So several studies were reviewed by CEI. The FB environmental study from 2021, um, a subsequent technical memo that was prepared this summer um, the Lake Auburn Watershed Management Plan from 2010, a diagnostic study of the Lake Auburn, of Lake Auburn that was from 2013. So there's a couple documents they looked at. And just a reminder that part of their scope, it says CEI has assumed one remote meeting, Zoom or conference call with the Lake Auburn Watershed Protection Commission, and one round of response to comments. So I would like to collect from you guys, you know, any comments that you might have. We can put those together in response. And if at some point we wanted a special meeting um, or some form of call with the consultants, that was included in their scope of services for the um, not to exceed $6,000. So with that in mind, what they, what CEI provided to us was actually Three different documents. There was a short, let's see, three page summary. There was a more in depth, more in detail, let's see, 12 page report. And then they also provided some answers to questions that Auburn Water District had and the city of Auburn had responded to. They provided um, some of their insight into those questions. Uh, the first round of questions was from August 8th from Auburn Water District to City of Auburn in which City responded. Um, the second round of questions was from August 23rd and these questions were from Auburn Water to 
at the environmental, but we did not get a response to those. So the first short overview memo gives um, basically a review of their findings. So that's this three-page document. Um, one of their one of CEI's first points is that they agree with FB Environmental's conclusions that Lake Auburn is nearing its capacity for nutrient loading um, and can't bear additional nutrient loads without diminishing water quality. They talk about FB's finding of no net environmental or economic or social benefits for more development at the watershed. And that even if there was less development in the headwater towns of the watershed, any development in Auburn has an outsized negative impact since its drainage goes directly to the lake. So they kind of recapped those, those points from the FB environmental study from 2021. Um, they then looked at some of the build out scenarios that were in this larger report by FB. Um, and some of their comments were the assumptions used in some of the modeling in this report were hard to compare to the technical memo that came out from FB this year. So they were kind of, this was a follow up to this. Um, at the city of Auburn's request, they wanted more information about how would a proposed septic change or zoning change, you know, impact the lake and impact the watershed. So CEI just said that some of the some of the modeling assumptions were hard to compare in those two documents. And one of the big points that they found was in this this document that came out this summer, it their build out analysis ignores any development in the ag zone. It assumes zero development in the ag zone. Um, and they thought, CEI thought that was unlikely that there would be no additional development in the ag zone. So just assuming that that's a zero isn't really an accurate representation of what could go on in that area around the lake. They also talk about if the septic system regulations were to change, um, that could open the door for future development. But with the zoning change in the rural residential area, if that happened along with septic change, um, they agreed the modeling suggests there would be less development. However, uh, they offer some recommendations rather than changing the septic standard. Um, they offer some, some alternatives to that. So one is to maintain the existing depth restrictions, so that 36 inch restriction, but allow for amendment of the soils to provide better treatment. So in their words, this prevents expansion of buildable areas while improving treatment capabilities of septic systems in sandy soils. And they say, why introduce new buildable areas at all if the focus is to reduce development? So that's one option that they provide. Keep the 36 inch, but if you have sandy soils that aren't great for septic treatment, modify those. They suggest allowing only one septic system per lot to avoid clustering, prohibit development within the 300 foot buffer of waters, considering septic systems closest to the lake pose the greatest risk of passing contaminants, and continue with zoning to reduce density of development. So their recommendation kind of with the septic and with the zoning pieces, keep the 36 inches, allow for amending the soils, but also continue with making development um, zoning more restrictive for development. So those address, those, those highlights address the proposed zoning changes that Auburn is looking at right now. And then they also do talk about the Grace Lawn Road watershed boundary change that we just went over. Um, and they acknowledged that the FB study looked at the studies that we just had CDM Smith look at, and it does appear to support certain groundwater flow in certain areas. Um, but they caution the city from discounting 
the whole area from the watershed entirely, particularly under a future development scenario. Um, and they say depending on how the sand and gravel pit is restored and developed, the mounding could be eliminated with the groundwater flows returning to their natural regional flow pattern where the area could contribute to the lake. So they're saying in that Grace Lawn pit area that was taken out of the watershed, that's back in the watershed that we just talked about, that kind of intermediate line, take caution with if that area gets developed or restored, that the flow could change. That's kind of the short and sweet version. Um, they go into much, much more detail about how they came to those conclusions in this longer 12-page report. Um, and I think the key part of this report is on page 8. It's the summary and conclusions, yep. rather than getting into the whole technical piece of it. And that piece, they do restate some of the findings in the shorter document. So, same thing. The lake is near its nutrient loading capacity. Um, more development cannot be allowed in Lake Auburn, in the Auburn portion of the watershed. Um, they talk about the Graceland area that we just talked about, so I won't go over that again. And they agree with some of the assumptions that FB Environmental used. Um, however, there were some contradictions between their, their two documents and that some development should be expected in the ag zone. It shouldn't just be assumed to be none, but that's one of their recommendations. Um, and I think the biggest one that is in this longer document but isn't touched on in this shorter one is the filtration waiver was based on protection measures in place when the waiver was granted. Um, you know, they, in their words, why risk jeopardizing the waiver to loosen septic, you know, septic restrictions? Um, so that's that's a key point that I think we need to think about in their recommendations. Is is any of this going to impact the waivers for the two utilities? And they talk about those specific septic recommendations again. Um, and in their words, finally, an extremely important consideration is the filtration waiver and whether loosening existing restrictions could jeopardize that way the waiver. Other means of protecting the watershed that do not loosen existing restrictions should be considered. Overall, I thought it was a little confusing going from memo to memo. And it is. Those are questions. Is this just a draft? And we can say, this is a draft. This into one summary up right. front. This is a draft. Yeah, because yeah. it's repetitive in some areas. Yep. So, so this this is a draft. I assume that uh, we probably wouldn't take specific action on this one uh, mm -hmm. the way mm -hmm. we did on CDM. Uh, it doesn't mean we doesn't mean we couldn't, but I assume that in the same way with CDM, we sort of sent it back with clarifying questions. We'd send this back. Having said that, though, uh, I did uh, tell members of the public that I give them uh, the opportunity to speak on this specific item. Mm -hmm. So, before we get into it. Um, I'd like to give members of the public that opportunity. Is there anyone from the public that wants to would like to uh, speak about this one, knowing that we're not um, making we're, the action we're taking tonight is to ask clarifying questions uh, to send back for a more finalized report? Yeah, Mr. Beal. <clears throat> I would just note again for the completeness of the record that. The parts of this, of these reports, uh, as Erica correctly says, the last one that she referred to being the most comprehensive one, the 12 page one, uh, refers to the changes in the septic uh, ordinance and also changes in lot size uh, in areas uh, within uh, the rural residential and low density country residential districts. Uh, this Auburn City Council, excuse me, the Auburn Planning Board actually made a positive recommendation to adopt the septic changes at a meeting back in April, I think it was April 12th, uh, but with the condition that that proposed change be paired with a change in lot size by uh, changing the areas within the watershed that were in rural residential to low density country residential, 
which affects the change from one acre minimum lot size up to three acres. Uh, that uh, was passed at the uh, planning board meeting on October 11. Neither of those items has yet come before the council, but the, the two parts of the pairing have now been acted upon by the planning board and are awaiting first and second uh, readings and hearings before the city council. I believe that's, I've stated this correctly, Mr. Seer. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Is there anyone else from the public that, yes, Mr. Reed? I, I guess on the first page of uh, the short report, the last two lines, FBE found no net environmental, economic, or social benefits supporting expansion of development in the Lake Auburn watershed. And then uh, at the end of the paragraph, CEI agrees with these findings. So, I, I would think that the job of the Lake Auburn Watershed Protection Commission would be would be uh, to look at that line and say, you know, we just don't recommend this. I mean, it, isn't that your job to say if this if there's no net environmental economic so there's no economic benefit to doing this or social benefit, I would think that this board should say. We don't recommend it. We don't recommend the septic change. We don't recommend, uh, you know, any of the changes that have been proposed uh, uh, by the city of Auburn. I, I think, you know, you've taken a, an oath <coughs> as a members of this board to protect the lake. I would think that that's the move that you should be moving forward to. That's all I have to say. The way I'd look at it. Thank you. I agree. Is there anyone else that has anything that? Yeah, Mr. Smith. I already and since, said. I was going to say, excellent. Yeah. Since you hadn't spoken yet, I was going to ask you to introduce yourself, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm Ryan Smith. I, I speak at a lot of the planning board council meetings this year. Um, I have a question. If there, a clarifying question we could ask um, is Is there a map uh, available showing where new buildable land will become available versus what will become unbuildable? Um, and does this take into account uh, nonconformity? So what I do for a living is code enforcement, and I get a lot of people asking me if a nonconforming lot is still buildable. And typically the rules are if, if your lot existed before an ordinance was put into effect, it's grandfathered, and so you can still build on it. So um, legally, uh, the, the city wouldn't be allowed. Uh, if someone only had 200 feet of road frontage now, and now they're going to be put into nonconformity, you can't assume that that lot's never going to be built on uh, because they can say, well, I, I own this before that ordinance was put into effect, therefore I'm grandfathered, you have to let me build here. So I don't see anything about that in here, but I haven't seen the extended report. Um, but also, I have a question about recommending more restrictions because right now in planning board and council, um, it, it seems to be the theme is take existing zoning and just kind of apply it in places um, could there be a recommendation for more restrictions? And it seems like the citizens want more restrictions along with these changes, the septic change, the zoning change. It seems like they want more restrictions. And what, what restrictions would they recommend? I know they kind of gave some, but can they give more you know, tree cutting uh, examples of what would help the quality um, in the watershed overlay districts and stuff like that and really just ask more questions. But they also keep pointing out inconsistencies with the first report. So it almost seems to me like we're going to have to redo some of this um, because like the phosphorus loads were updated from what 2021 to 2022 study um, and it doesn't, so those are all my questions just in general um, on what could be clarified in this. But my biggest one is the new buildable land, who that benefits um, and who it negatively impacts with the septic change because I don't believe the septic change is grandfathered. You can't say I used to be able to build here under the old septic ordinance, and the new one I can't. That one would take that lot completely out of the question. Um, so yeah, those are all my questions. Sorry, that was a little... <coughs> no, no, that's fine. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak? Mm, okay, I'll, I'll bring it back. Um, the map showing... Uh, Developable land uh, is in the FB environmental report. Mm -hmm. 
And yes, they did take into account those lots that um, are, would be legally non-conforming uh, existing prior to the zone change. So uh, if you look at the, the numbers in there, uh, and the, the inconsistency between the two uh, is derived specifically from um, a question from the City Council and Planning Board in Auburn who wanted FB to go back and look at what would this look like with these zoning changes in place and they were specifically asked uh, by the city to exclude ag land as developable land so that's why FB did it. Um, as a note, uh, last night, or oh, I should say Monday, the City Council just uh, voted to initiate a zone change for review which will come in front of the Planning Board. Um, the Planning Board is not taking up that item immediately. We're, 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 we're also getting feedback from the uh, Sustainability Board, the Natural Resources and Sustainability Board. Um, and the Planning Board is choosing to take, and Auburn is choosing to take a, a couple months to, to workshop uh, what, what's come out of this result from the City Council, but part of it is to um, redline residences being allowed in the Ag Zone within the watershed. So actually kind of following up on that and saying um, there would be no houses in there. So not that that necessarily changes um, what we would end up saying when this comes back to us, but just as, as a point of information um, for folks. And could, could I clarify, uh, ask a question about the initial resolve from the council and what passed last night? I didn't see last night's. Mm -hmm. But in the initial one, there was a bullet point in there that said if someone could prove for the planning board that their development would not impact the lake, they could build within the watershed. Mm -hmm. uh, Monday nights was, it redlined it. Oh, they took it out. Yeah, okay. it was like, sh shall not be allowed. Okay. It was not contingent okay. upon a I planning board. I had a board. question about yeah. that. Yeah, that's, I had to feel that quite a bit, okay. actually since Monday. Okay. Um, and, um, Can I ask? Quick question yeah. on that too. So, yeah, in the city council agenda packet, it still had that language. So, yeah. was it? I didn't watch the meeting, but was it discussion at the meeting to redline that? Um, I wish I had it here. So, the agenda packet included the initial resolve and the updated one. The updated oh, one is like a update. whereas bang. That's it. It was like okay. very short, and then okay. they amended it to be even clearer at the meeting. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sear, okay. May I? Uh, yes, Mr. Beal. Um, further to the City Council action of Monday night, uh, the matter was uh, referred to the Planning Board with a revised order, uh, not a resolve, they changed it to an order. Yes. Uh, and that matter is on the Planning Board agenda for next week, for the 15th, for a workshop. Correct. Um, just so that uh, these board members will be aware that Although it's styled as a workshop, it is already before the planning board in that fashion. Yes, and correct. And so, uh, since you know, uh, uh, for clarification, the workshop, uh, the upcoming workshop is really about planning board members asking questions about what information is currently available. So the planning board does plan on taking as much time as it can. We have a deadline, so we can't take as much time as we want, but as much time as we can. So. Um, but, uh, back to this though, uh, Mr. Beal did bring up a good point though, that um, these recommendations have already gone through the planning board and essentially could be taken up whenever the city council wants to take them up. So my question would be, after tonight when we have questions, how soon could we get something back? Yeah, and that's not, um, I don't have that spelled out in the scope, but I can find out and say if we have a certain timeline that we would like to meet, can that, can, can they work with that? Yeah, okay. Is there a, a date or time frame you had in mind based on 
other city or planning board going on? So you're, you're asking me to predict what the council's going to do? That's like... <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Do we need to authorize extra funding to do this? No, this what that was okay. a part of the part of it. That was part of the six thousand, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. the, yep. So uh, they have assumed one meeting and one round of response to comments. Um, but there were those questions. So I did I did answer the question about the map, but it's it's worth um, it's we, we might as well throw that to them. And you know, like, is there assumption about building? Does it include um, those non-conforming lots? Uh, that is to say, that, did they make the same assumptions that FB Environmental did when they identified the number of possible building lots? Um, so they just did, okay, so ask CEI if they included non-conforming lots in their assumptions. Right. Right, okay. Um, I think... Um, they might, I think they might hesitate at giving us more specific restrictions. It's, uh, it's been sort of my experience that consultants don't like to, they just don't like to, right? Unless they, they have to speak something specific, but. Um. Um, I, so I would, I had a question. So they referenced the the um, the changing the thirty six inches, um, but I guess I was confused because the proposed ordinance change utilizes thirty six inches as well. It just doesn't require the natural thirty six inches, and so for me, I guess the clear, I would want clarification as to like why they felt. Because they utilize 36 inches, so why they felt like it, the 36 inches of currently existing was was better than 36 inches of, of amended soil. Because they also mentioned the use of like you could use amended soils to to make that a much better system. And I guess I was just confused because I was thinking like um, the proposed zoning change does utilize 36. So I just I was confused in their analysis about that. Like to what? dovetail his, his um, confusion as mine as well, I think the study, the consultants want us to continue using it as a de facto zoning ordinance. Maybe the consultants can come up with an actual ordinance to prevent development that makes more sense than saying you have to have native 36 inches soil. Because you can build to that standard, and that's been an argument for a long time. And again, they're re, you know, claiming this argument that has no scientific justification. You know, they just they want to use the ordinance to prevent development because they don't want us to build to that standard. So to me, it's it's well, you're kind of getting into debate, but I think I think what's in there is is the question. Okay. Um, what would be a recommendation? What would they recommendation? What would they recommend other than using the septic as a mechanism for right. restricting, restricting development? development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think that we have talked about as a board quite a bit, and I've shared several times that to me it does not it does not make sense to use an outdated septic system around a lake to limit development. Um, but there's certainly alternatives in what, what might those yeah. be. Yeah. I think one of the reasons they they kept that 36 inches was just acknowledging that if you get into alternative systems or mounted systems that there is more maintenance and there, you know, who's who takes that responsibility on for monitoring. Yeah, and that was, that was sort of in there, kind of peppered throughout, mm -hmm. um, which is why I was, like, I was kind of seeing that, but I would like it if they were a little more forward in explaining why 136 inches, they, why they believe like 136 inch standard is better than the other 36 inch. I think that would be helpful for me. I apologize for that kind of Yeah, see, so, yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're going to have to wrap up some too for me as well. But are there other questions? 
So what are we asking them to do? We are asking them. Yeah. Can I just have a recap of questions? Yeah. So I've, yeah. I've got um, the dairy assumptions include non-conforming lots. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, what, what exactly for, for this for the septic piece? Did we have a specific question or comment? Yeah, the current standard, the current standard is 36, <laughs> and they are recommending 36. What's the difference? If the uh, if the if the current is 36 and the recommended, the not recommended from them. Right. Okay. The proposed. Let's say right. proposed. Yeah. The yeah. proposed is 36. I think what's the what's the difference? So the current 36 inch of native soils versus 36 inch proposed but allowed for mounded. Yeah. What what are they seeing a difference? Yeah. Okay. And then the mechanism for or limiting development other than subject, yeah. Other than you say no. Right, just say no. Exactly. And then, so my assumption is those questions would be that we're asking them to answer those questions within an updated final draft of this for us to review. And that we would, we would love that sooner than later given the timeline from given the fact that Council has given a timeline when they're going to act, but that they could act pretty much whenever they feel like it. Um, I know staff included this kind of comment too that like having the three different documents isn't ideal. Marianne, you mentioned that. Do you want me to ask too? Can you consolidate this and do like an executive Until summary? Point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Which, yes, yeah, please. Excellent point. And I think it would be helpful. I don't know if they're able to do this, but where they reference, you know, a map or something, if they could include that in the final report, perhaps. Yep. So we're, you know, not having to flip back to another report. Yeah, I guess I didn't even pick up on that because I had to look at those maps so often that. Yeah, it's in your mind. It's like, just like, I'm like. Yeah, oh, so right. whatever they're referring to, um, if it's an FB, you know, environmental table or map or whatever, they just put that in there. Yep. Um, so we can really review that together. Um, I found it a little bit confusing when they were asking questions within their report. That, yes, you would do that conversationally, but is it, should they be in the report? Like, why would you do this? Why would oh, you yeah, that seemed, you know I mean? little, it seemed yeah. almost a little inappropriate because yes. I thought, like, if yes. I were to use this, yeah. if I were to bring this to the when city, the city would be like, you know, what is that? Good point, right? Yep. So either restate it or just take the question out. It was a couple of those. Yep. State what you want to state. That's it. Yeah. 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 Oh, and, yeah. okay, I have a question. I'm not sure, and that's what you need to go but why? So this report was very much in line with what they've given us in the past. Um, in the past, they've offered updating septic as an option if you do X, Y, Z, and this one, that was, like, it would, I, I would just be interested to know why they, they so sort of changed their recommendation in that way, but. Um, I don't, so in their, their 2010 Washington Management Plan, they recommended not changing anything with septic. Is there another one that? Yeah, what uh, are you I was the, the uh, 2009, so right before that one, right before the watershed. I think that might have been part of that plan, but. Uh, yeah, it was included as part of it. Okay. But they, they, I mean, I guess it. I mean, they don't really have to answer that. It's not. That was more. I guess that was more like a personal, personal question. That. Um, yeah, they had like a. Wapak has the following options: one, maintain the ordinance as it is and allow the use of mounted systems; two, allow mounted systems using it to control density, and, the, and using zoning to control density. And then they also talked about um, with that having. Um, uh, like increased phosphorus plant, uh, phosphorus control, um, and monitoring of septic systems and things. And so I, I was just, 
Did they, yeah, were those just options, but did they recommend? I'd have to look at it, I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was like, that was in the recommendation section, but. Okay. Um, it, was, it was just interesting to me. I was wondering why they, why previously they had done that, but not now, but I don't know if like something had changed there, like, because that was 2009, I mean, we're talking, you know, mm -hmm. over, you know, at, at this point, we're talking 13, 13, mm -hmm. going on 14 mm -hmm. years, so I don't know if there is like new information or. Yeah, they, right, and they talked about that. So CEI performed a leak over watershed septic system analysis in October 20, 2009, to evaluate whether septic design criteria should be modified <coughs> consistent with the state's less stringent criteria. The key findings were, and Z. Right, so the, you know what I mean? Like they pulled it out, but they didn't. I guess that's what that's what made me go back and look at it. Was like, oh, it, it was just different from what they had right now in 2009. But and are there other questions? Any other questions? I think they could identify or explain, I guess, in a paragraph or something that this was a previous recommendation. This is where things have changed. Or maybe some of those things are still good. You know, like they still want to require a monitoring system if any changes were made. This is yeah. these are yeah. practices that we recommend. Yeah. So it didn't say these are options, but we don't recommend them. It just said it's in their recommendations as options. Yeah. Would it behoove us to have a meeting with them at some point? Or I know it's in the budget, but mm -hmm. I don't know. No, it is in the budget one. I think yeah. when, we, when we get their okay. final so draft, we might want to have them. them. And yeah. that's one okay. thing that we, for our commission schedule, you know, we have the December 7th meeting, mm -hmm. you know, said if needed for budget adoption, that obviously was passed. So if we wanted to I, use I that, we, yeah, if, yeah. If, it's if we can we'll get, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get yeah. okay, that's so good. I can ask and then I'll yep. send the yeah. message out. Yeah. Any other questions about this specifically? No, but there would also be time to the drinking water group to answer back by yeah. December 7th. Yeah. Maybe invited so. to the yep. meeting and hear the presentation. I don't um, know if you need to call that as a special meeting where it's really not needed for budget, but just talking procedure. Um, I like the date, though. We'll just vote. It's usually just a regular meeting. Yeah. It's usually just, yeah, we, we say whether it's, we cancel it if we don't right. need it. So uh, we'll if I remember it. correctly, okay. I don't know. I've only, been, I've only been here like a year, so. You're correct. So it's still a regular yeah. meeting? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that dates are Yeah, it always so goes good. out with the schedule. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, last item, the 7B adoption of modified Roberts rules. Uh, I did send everyone an email kind of giving you some thoughts that Rick and I had. Um, we're looking at adopting a modified Roberts of rules. Uh, we don't think it's appropriate for this board, and of course, you all agree or disagree when Rick and I break something to necessarily utilize Roberts rules in full because they're kind of set up for a uh, stricter parliamentary well, procedure. They can be adversarial at times. And we were looking at, okay, well, like, what do we really need to do to be able to get things done in a positive way, but not necessarily uh, combat each other. Uh, it is supposed to be, after all, an interlocal cooperative agreement. Form us. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, so uh, giving Rick feed and I feedback on well, which specific motions people think we need, if there are any motions that you think are adversarial enough that we should avoid them and, and think about alternatives. Um, uh, Besides what you presented? Sorry, I'm no. just grabbing yeah. the sidebar. I don't think I, no, yeah, no. I kind of breezed through that. Uh, I, would, I, would say, I, would say, I would say go look at what Marianne gave us because okay. I don't see us using a ton more of that and also you utilizing a cheat sheet. Again? Okay. Utilizing a cheat sheet in that yes. way in our bylaws. So if Marianne could send that out to all of us again, just would, yeah, are you able to do that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, additionally, um, so I talked about you know we'll need to define um, clerk. clerk. Well, we also need to define the uh, the duties and powers of officers as well. Um, so like right now. Rick and I have not, we don't have a carte blanche per se, but we were given a, like a pretty wide berth as long as both of us agree on something, right? And is that, do we want that moving forward? I mean, we did it out of necessity, but, but we, may, we may not want that moving forward, right? Um, so kind of defining that. And so this was really for me to kind of give you 
more of an update um, of where we're at, but that we're looking at. It sounded like people were okay last time we talked about adopting Robert's rules, but adopting a modified Robert's yeah. rules, tying that into a set of bylaws mm -hmm. that also define like you know basically what's on agenda, you know things like that, but not. Um, what we what we're going to present to you guys is going to be. Uh, it, it's not going to be super comprehensive. Yeah. It's going to be this is what the minimum we think we need to move yeah. forward, and so let's not burden ourselves with on uh, additional undue regulation that we may not actually may not actually help us do our jobs, mm -hmm. and then if we need to add things, we can add things. So that's where that's at. Any questions about that? When do you want to do that? Uh, not the December meeting. Okay. No, no, no. That probably won't happen at the December meeting. But we would like we would like feedback yeah. from you guys at any time going forward. Uh, Rick and I are going to try to meet again sometime in the next couple weeks. Um, we're both simultaneously easy to pin down and hard to pin down at the same time. So it's been sort of like just so we can get a framework back that. You know, because if there's something in front of you, in front of us, that it'll be easier to talk about it than if we all try to come up with something at a meeting you know, together. So. Yeah, I think so too. We can fine tune it. Yep. All right. Sounds good. Can we make a motion to adjourn? Excellent. Yeah. Is there? <laughs> Pretty else done. Did you motion that? Yeah, she just did. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? That's correct. <laughs> I second it. All right. There's a second. <laughs> all those in favor? Second. Can you hear me? <laughs> in favor, all. All right. Meeting is adjourned. Good. Thank you.